Hello, this is David, as usual, coming at you with another video. Um, I decided before we even start, um, my first warning will be um, the presentation might, might not as be as good as usual because I'm kind of, um, I haven't practiced talking a lot, so <laughs> it sounds kind of weird, but uh, it's been a while since I made a video format like this. And um, I ultimately decided because I think a lot of people kind of, you know, doesn't really understand uh, the distinctions, uh, the relation between meophysis and geophysis. I, I'm seeing a lot of people uh, getting very confused and some other people that accuse me of ecumenism, really stupid people that think I'm an ecumenist because I cons consistently say meophysis and geophysis are both acceptable. By the way, which is um, an argument used by many church fathers. I'm not the only one that's using this argument. Uh, so yeah, we're going to be in in this video. We're going to be covering these two key terminological uh, Christological terms. So in this video, we're going to be looking at the state of Oriental communion to communion and compare um, these two, so that people understand, you know, like what are the differences between these two communions. And then we're going to be looking at the terms itself. And then Saint Kirill who is very instrumental in this debate. We're going to be looking at what his Christology is. So let's start with OOs and us, Orthodox. So a lot of people don't really understand. So first of all, we're not in communion with each other. We have to understand that. A lot of people don't even know that, right? They think we're kind of the same church because we have Orthodox in our names. I mean, that's kind of, it's kind of stupid, but uh, no, we're not the same church. We're not in communion with each other. So an orth Orthodox Christian cannot go to an Oriental church and take communion there. Likewise, an Oriental cannot do the same. Um, there are some instances here and there that happens, but that's not the norm. That's not what's supposed to happen. And there are many theological, liturgical, and uh, just in general quality of life differences that we have. Essence and just distinction will be one of them. Uh, I have never seen a single Coptic Orthodox talk about essence energies distinction and defending it. I've seen I've seen them say that it's polemism. And even there is a certain um, Oriental heterodox uh, that spoke in an Orthodox seminary, and he made a presentation uh, talking about the differences. And he talks about essence energies distinction. He talks about theosis. And he says, these are all Palamite stuff, right? This, it's stuff that Palamas cooked up. And we, we, dif we differ there. We don't have the same doctrine. So I'm, I'm going to be linking that video so you can check out for yourself. So I'm not, I'm not making this stuff up, right? These are actual Coptic clergy that come to Orthodox seminaries and talk about this stuff. So we differ on Theosis. Now, a lot of people talk about Pope Shenouda. I've heard some people argue that Shenouda doesn't actually deny theosis, he's actually denying a corrupted form of it where human nature becomes a divine nature. That, yes, we will we will say that that's not theosis, that's, that's, that's wrong, that's heresy. But it still proves that there is a rift in the Oriental communion between theosis. Right? For us, it's really simple, right? We have theosis, the, uh, our humanity becomes deified by God's energies, by God's uncreated grace. And we become gods, not by nature, but by grace. Right? That's a simple doctrine that every Orthodox agrees. For the Oriental community, that's still a, <laughs> an issue they disagree on. Ironically, they're the ones that came up with theosis, supposedly. And yet they, they're, they're not uniform on theosis. So they have some people that think that human nature becomes the divine nature. So there's still a sizable amount of people in the Oriental community that believes that. That's an issue. Iconography, Coptic iconography is dying. So you, you see the iconography in this image here, that's dying. And Coptic Orthodox themselves, they're admitting that it's on the grassroots level is dying. And I'm willing to link the article. And this article is from, let me see, F Father Moses Saman. Saman, Saman. I don't know how to spell that name. But he argues that, yes, or tradition is basically dying. Leavened versus unleavened bread. This is a point of contention that we have with the Armenians, who are still in the communion itself. They use unleavened bread. Um, we're way past the Old Testament period. We're in the New Testament. So we're using the, le the leavened bread. And this is actually something to schism over. That's one of the things that really kick-started the 1054 schism, is the leavened versus unleavened bread controversy. So it's an important topic. And 
the OOs not only do some of them use unleavened bread, they're not uniform, right? For them, it's an optional thing. For us, it's actually an essential belief. Circumcision. Uh, OOs have circumcision. And this this really, even canonically speaking, circumcision is allowed. You, it, the Coptic can speak of circumcision, doing circumcision before baptism, right? Whereas baptism replaces circumcision. It's the new circumcision. So why are you circumcising your children? Right? It makes no theological sense. So on that topic, we also disagree. Cousin marriage. Coptic Orthodox Church has cousin marriage. Uh, they allow marriage between cousins. We don't allow that. We don't allow cousin marriages. And... To understand the schism, uh, a lot of people think 451 is the date where the schism was set in place. Actually, it's at the 530s um, with Patriarch Theodosius I. He was the uh, Coptic Patriarch who was deposed by St. Justinian. And after being deposed, after being sent to exile, he still um, basically made new bishops, right? So he set up parallel church structures. And this is when the when the schism really originated. Before then, it was a huge theological issue, but there wasn't a schism back then. right? So, so the schism took around 80 years to really happen. But 451 is when you could say that the schism between the Coptic Church and the, the Orthodox Church really occurred. And not occurred, but was fundamentally set in place. So let's talk about the history of the term Eophysis itself. And this is going to be more about the term rather then the concept behind well, a little bit of the concept. So the first really Orthodox church father that used the term is St. Kirill himself. Um, the reason why he even used it is not because he wants to introduce something new, but rather he thought that it was an Athanasian term. However, it seems uh, that upon research, both in the 6th century and, and even later on, turns out, that it's an Apollinarian forgery, right? So Apollinarius and his followers will uh, regularly write certain epistles to certain people. Ad Jovian will be one of them. And uh, they will attribute it to certain saints. So they will say, oh, this is written from St. Athanasius. This is written from St. blah, blah, blah. And upon researching about these documents themselves, we come to we came to the conclusion, especially today, that they are indeed forgeries, but even way back, right? So for example, Ad Jovian, who was ascribed to St. Athanasius, was actually written by Apollinarius of Laodicea. And we know this because one of his disciples, Polemon, admitted it, right? He says, this is from my, uh, basically from my father, not father, but from my mentor, right? And even before that, the concept, the terminology itself was used by Arians. So Eudoxius of Constantinople will be one of them, where he uses the Miaphysis terminology and argumentation. Apollinarius will be one of those many examples. And the concept itself, in their mind, right? And St. Kirill did not have this concept in mind, but in, in the mind of Arius, is, it's basically denying the full humanity of Christ. For example, for Apollinarius, it meant that uh, there was a human body, but he did not have a fully human nature. So his soul was not a human soul. It was basically the word of God indwelling and replacing the soul, basically. Because for him, soul meant a, a person, right? A, a soul is what a person really is, what a hypostasis really is. And St. Kirill used the Miaphysis formula regularly until the formula for union, where the Miaphysis formula becomes the accepted norm. Now, even after the formula for union, he still uses Mia Physis, um, that the Christ is one. I think that writing is where he uses Mia Physis formula. So he he doesn't have a problem with the Mia Physis formula. But what's really important to understand is what St. Kill taught when he was using the formula. A huge mistake that several of his opponents made is that they assumed that he was talking about the same thing Apollinarius was talking, right? But St. Kirill numerous times will indeed say that, no, he, he has a fully human nature. He, Christ has a fully human soul, right? And so he's, he constantly distinguishes himself from Apollinarius and tries to do so in Council of Ephesus. Um, so that's really where the confusion stems from, is its Apollinarian history. 
And the way St. Cyril uses mere physics is he's basically saying that there's one enfleshed reality of God the Word. The whole disputation that St. Cyril had with Nestorius, as I pointed out in my debate review, <coughs> is about mere physics versus diophysis, which I'll get on later. But Nestorius believed in a strict diophysis uh, Christology. <coughs> and at the time, the terminology of what physics meant, what nature meant, is not the same thing what nature means today, right? In Kalkada, nature means essence. In their debate, because they use the antique sense of physics, it, it does mean hypostasis, yes, but it's kind of different. It means a individual reality. So St. Kirill is saying there's one individual reality and there's one prosopon, right? Because the prosopon is a faculty of physics in that terminological scheme. That's why Nestorius, Nestorius' theology ultimately led to two persons because he believed in two individual realities, two subjects, and he will say that they're united in a prosopic union, but St. Kirill listens to that and he says, no, 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 the, the logic is inconsistent, right? Nestorius, your logic is inconsistent. It leads to two sons, like your heretical teachers, Diodor and Theodoret uh, of Mopsuestia try to teach. And so that's essentially what the whole concept of mere physics is really about. Um, there are numerous other instances where St. Kirill does use the Cappadocian um, terminology, where hypostasis, nature, they're all distinct terms. <clears throat> but um, what mere physics ultimately means is that Christ is out of two natures. Right? He is composed of two natures. Yes, he's in terms of natures, he's composite. St. Kirill does say that. Um, and that's what it means. That's what mere physics means. And as far as, as far as that's concerned, we will agree. We will say, yes, he is out of two natures. And, uh, that's even what the fifth council even says. So let's take a look at diaphysis, right? What does that, what does diaphysis mean? Well, there's multiple interpretations. So for example, there's an historian strict diaphysitism that originated from people like Diodor of Tarsus, Theodorus of Mopsuestia, they're really the ardent proponents of strict diophysitism, which is basically two sons theology, original Nestorianism, so we will say. And as I mentioned before, Nestorius used diophysis to argue for dual subject uh, manifestations in Christ, right? Dual subject, but a united manifestation in Christ. So person was a property of nature. And in Chalcedon, the terminological precision regarding this formula becomes much clearer. It's very crucial to understand St. Kirill's relation with diophysitism because the strict diophysite position that I just recently talked about is what he's attacking, right? He's attacking strict diophysitism, which we don't accept, right? Chalcedon doesn't accept this strict position. But this is generally what gets people confused is that they think that because he attacks strict diophysitism that he condemns all forms of diophysitism. Now we'll get to that later, but we will agree that if you look at St. Kirill's writings that he does prefer Miaphysis to the diophysis formula. So he has a strong preference for Miaphysis. One might ask why is that the case? Is it because he believes that's more correct? Well, if even if that's the case, it just makes a lot more sense that he's a bigger proponent of mere physics formula because there is a huge Christological controversy going on. If you haven't noticed, between his stories and St. Kirill, and if you haven't noticed, he's trying to emphasize the oneness, the unity of Christ. And that's what he's trying to emphasize. And even afterwards, there were still controversies regarding Nestorian theology. And he was trying very, very hard to completely eradicate all forms of Nestorian thinking. And he did a very good job at that. But people think uh, because of his emphasis on the oneness that he somehow completely ignores the duality. Right. So the main issue with strict diophysite position, as I said, is that prosopon is a property of physics in that system. So you have two different manifestations um, and that leads to two persons. Right. Uh, but he does accept diophysis with certain qualifications and formula for union is very key and other certain letters are very key. He accepts that those natures are properties instead of subjects. So what he means is that if you say that the natures are just basic notional properties instead of, you know, actual persons, actual subjects, and which leads to you confessing that there's a single person still, 
uh, he will say that he accepts that, right? That's one of the qualifications he uses. Another qualification is that it's a real, there's a real union, not a union by energy, which is actually what Nestorius believed. It's kind of a weak union, but a real actual union where, it, where in the union, uh, it becomes one, right? So in terms, it becomes hypostatically one. And so Diophysis uh, formula emphasizes Christ in being in two natures. And this is the formula that was accepted at Chalcedon. But now it's very important to understand what Chalcedon actually teaches because a lot of people mistake the teachings of Chalcedon. They don't really understand what's being taught here. And because of that, they're getting uh, persuaded by Oriental heterodox who are not really honest about what Chalcedon teaches. Historically speaking, they always straw man the Chalcedonian position as if it teaches strict diophysitism and the fact that Nestorius um, claimed that he accepts the Chalcedonian definition which refutes him as well by the way as we'll see later on uh, didn't really help now on the left here we have the Chalcedonian definition so I would like to make sure you you pay attention there and if you check the uh, debate review I did um, the red lines are basically Kyrillian terms, and the, and the blue line is the ter, uh, Saint Leo's terms, right? So as you can see here, there's a lot of there's a sea of Kyrillian uh, quotations in the Chalcedonian definition, which itself I think is a very strong argument against um, OO apologetics. But what I want you to focus on is the key line uh, where where it says one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begun, who is made known. This is very important. Made, who is made known in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, without sep separation. Now we need to understand what does made known in two natures mean. The Greek word used is norizumenon, and what it means is that it's made known according to the intellect. So let's contrast that with St. Kirill's, uh, one of St. Kirill's qualifications for the Diophysit formula. As to the manner of the incarnation of the only begotten, then, theoretically speaking, only insofar as it appears to the eyes of the soul, we will admit that there are two united natures, but only one Christ and Son and Lord, the Word of God made man and made flesh. This is very crucial, because what Chalcedon says and what St. Kill says is the same exact thing. Christ is made known into natures according to the eyes of the soul, according to Teoria, according uh to the intellect, basically. And I will get to this later, what it means, because some people don't really understand. Wait, wait what, does, what does it mean that Christ is made known in two natures according to the intellect only? Like, what does it mean? And we'll get to that in a couple minutes. Um, in terms of St. Leo's tome, we have another Kirlin quotation that accepts the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one prosopon. So we have, I believe this is from formula for union he says uh, as for the evangelical and apostolic sayings about the lord we are aware that the theologians take some as common as referring to one referring to one prosopon but distinguish others as referring to two natures that they interpret the god befitting ones in accordance with the godhead of the christ and the humble ones in accordance with the manhood and then in relation on says that we too think in this way right so he doesn't only say that this is acceptable but he says we agree, we, we say the exact same thing. And this is very crucial in, in Diophysite in thought because in Diophysite thought because that is what Chalcedon has been teaching all this time. What is that's what Saint Leo's Tom and always teaches and when people say um, you know, the form of man suffering and the form of God making miracles, when when the Tom of Leo talks about that a lot of the argumentation is that uh, that's, that's Nestorian. No, actually, if that's Nestorian, St. Kirill is also Nestorian. So either they're both Nestorian or they're both Orthodox. And if you say St. Kirill is Nestorian, then you're basically uh, saying that your own saint is a Nestorian. So it doesn't make any sense. And the, the Kirillian adverbs used, where he supplants, in essence, three of the four adverbs used in Chalcedon, is without confusion, without change, and without alteration. Those adverbs are used in the Chalcedonian definition. So I think this is pretty sufficient to prove that Chalcedon has Kirill, Saint Kirill in mind. That And the reason why I'm even talking about this is, again, there are certain qualifications that Saint Kirill uses. All of those qualifications 
are in the Chalcedonian definition. When St. Kirill says Diophysis can be correct only and if only with the certain qualifications, Chalcedon uses all of those qualifications. So essentially, we're saying what St. Kirill is saying. And rejecting that is rejecting St. Kirill, unfortunately for you. Now, one really key aspect in Christology, which is lost in Oriental theology that St. Kirill himself used, is enhypostatization. So what really is enhypostatization? It is a personalized mode that a particular property exists in. Now, what, I'm, what, is, what does that really mean? Well, a good example will be how does the divine nature exist, right? How is it that the divine nature exists? How does God exist? Well, the divine nature exists in the mode of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so that's how we know that the divine nature really does exist. It exists in the mode of person. That is in hypostatization. So nature does not have existence in and of itself, but it has its existence in the mode of persons. And that is what into natures according to the intellect really means. It's talking about in hypostatization. We see two natures in Christ in the single person, in the single hypostasis, because he in hypostatizes those two natures. And that's what that's the mode, the, the, the humanity and the divinity, it, it, they both exist in the mode of a single hypostasis. That is precisely what the hypostatic union even is. Final question to tackle in this video will pretty much be, uh, what really is uh, creating this rift between us and, uh, and the Orientals, right? What's, what's, what really is the main issue that we have it on? A lot of people think, uh, that it's mere physicism that's keeping us away. But I will say that we 98% agree with mere physicism. Uh, there are some aspects that uh, they take too far. But we will agree with that principle. We will both agree with the mere physicist formula of St. Kirill. But the rejection of theophysitism is really the problem here. Now, what does it mean to reject theophysitism? What's the logical consequence? Well, the, the logical consequence will be that in, in the oriental scheme, it will be that uh, you're rejecting dual properties in Christ. As Severus of Antioch himself says, uh, he believes in the theandric energy and theandric will, but he rejects them as being duality. He, he even says that us uh, accepting theandric energy and theandric will is a rejection of every duality. And so what this means is that diophysitism is talking about the dual properties. To believe in diophysitism is to believe in diotelitism and dioenergism. So that means... Uh, that you believe that Christ possesses two energies and two wills. Because energies and wills are properties of nature. They're not a property of person. That's precisely the error of Oriental heterodoxy. Is to root the... Um, is to equate hypostasis with nature and to root wills and energies with the hypostasis, with the person agency. What's the problem? Well, one of the problems, uh, one of the many problems will be that if... The, if personal agency is the root of energy and will, then that means in the Trinity there are three separate wills. But in Trinitarian theology, that's completely unacceptable. Actually, the Trinity has a single energy and a single will because they have they possess a single nature. So that will be one of the many consequences of uh, the rejection of di diaphysitism. Ultimately, it leads to uh, monotelitism and monoenergism, which the Oriental Communion has expressed support for for the longest time. And and so, yeah. And so this will pretty much conclude the video. I uh, hope you guys learned something. Um, forgive me if I've been very poor at presenting this. It, this was kind of a tough video to make. And I'll see you guys in the next video. And if, I'm, if I don't have a new stream tomorrow or any new video, Happy New Year's. For those in a new calendar, Merry Christmas. For those in an old calendar, such as myself, we will celebrate Christmas later on. <laughs> in the real 25th of December. So thank you all for watching. Um, hope you guys enjoyed this video. I'll see you guys in the next video. God bless you all. Thank you.